Hello, and welcome to Calgary First Church of the Nazarene. My name is Penny Robb, and I'm one of the church board members. Today, a big welcome back to the university students of Ambrose, the University of Calgary, and Mount Royal University. We're praying for you to have a successful year. For today's service, Melanie will be leading worship. Our children's pastor, Laurel, will be doing the kids' blessing. The Ewings and Heather will be talking to us about a missions trip. Shrimal will lead us in prayer and scripture. Pastor Brian will be continuing his But God message. If you remember last week, he gave us a great visual with a propane tank and scrap metal, and he brought us back to the scripture of David and Goliath. Whether you're an underdog or highly educated, God can use us all under his anointing if we humble ourselves. Melanie will close with a song, and Pastor Brian will provide some special announcements for our church family. We hope you enjoy your time today with us.
before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is graven on his hands. My name is written. Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased with his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior.
first, Naz families. The time has finally come that we are ready to begin our new church at home for kids, beginning next week, September 20th. Instead of viewing the main service video with a kid's moment, you will have your very own service video you can watch with your family and maybe some friends. If you have registered for our family worship hack, these will be picked up this week at the church, Tuesday and Wednesday from 4 to 7 p.m. and will be ready for you to open when you view your first lesson video next Sunday. If you didn't register for a worship pack this month, that is okay. These lesson videos will be premiering each week and can be viewed on their own. If you would like to register for future family worship packs for another month, there will be information coming soon on how to do that. I can't wait to worship through song, activities, Bible learning, and more with you. In addition, we have our midweek kids ministry, Awana, starting on September 23rd. I want to take a moment this morning and pray for these ministries beginning. Would you pray with me? God, we are so thankful for this church family that you have placed us in. God, we know that you have so many things this year that you are wanting to do with us and in and through us as well. God, we pray for these two ministries, our church at home and our Awana ministries that are starting this next week. We pray, Lord, that you will use these ministries to reach so many kids for you and that through these ministries, your truth and love will be proclaimed. God, I pray for all of my friends who are listening this morning that you will speak to them this week, help them prepare for what you have ready for them in store as we begin the school year together. We love you, Jesus, and we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Talk to you later, friends. Bye. My name is Debbie Ewing, and uh, since 2008, my husband and I have been leading work and witness trips, um, mostly to South America, Central America. We've been to Haiti. And this year, uh, we're planning our fourth trip to Mezcala, Mexico. And um, we've been planning this for a little while, but because of... Uh, the coronavirus, things have been in flux, and we have uh, not been able to plan the way we normally do. Um, however, that's given us lots of opportunity to um, pray about the trip uh, and about what the Lord wants us to do. And so, uh, during this process, um, I felt challenged um, because we also lost Evelyn Roy in um, late February. And so I felt challenged to do something special in her honor. And so um, during that prayer time, the Lord really challenged me to think big, to pray big, and to kind of extend our, uh, our trip to something that we hadn't really done before. And so I thought about doing just children's ministry. Instead of doing a construction project and then throwing in children's ministry, I just really felt led to minister to the children of Mezcala. And um, that led to some conversations about child development centers. And then um, I emailed the uh, work and witness uh, missionary who's down in Mexico, David Webb, and I just asked, you know, what would it take to create uh, or start a child development center in um, Mezcala, Mexico? Well, I wasn't really expecting a whole lot in return, but his email back to me just blew me away because in Mexico right now has no child development centers, zero. And they are starting one in South Mexico, so it's kind of underway. Um, but the next one on their list was Mezcala. So, bingo, God was way ahead of me. And uh, what I thought was, you know, just dreaming big and uh, thinking outside the box, the Lord had already gone ahead. He'd already prepared. And he has big plans for that. Um, currently, the missionary, uh, the... Um, 
district superintendent and a child psychologist are working on a plan as far as what that, what that will look like, uh, what we need to have in place, and the steps that we need to go through. So that's where we're at right now. I am so excited and uh, looking forward to um, doing something big in Evelyn's name and to honor her, uh, her memory. And uh, I think that if uh, she were here, she would be very excited. So um, I've asked Heather to just um, talk about what this uh, project means to her and Mike and Harper. I'm the aforementioned Heather. <laughs> um, most of you probably know me, and I feel like many of you know our daughter, Evelyn, who unfortunately passed away in February of this year. Um, many years ago, Debbie and Eric led Mike on a trip, a mission trip to Haiti. And Ev was quite little, just a toddler at that time, so not quite old enough to understand it. But as she grew and Mike continued to talk about the experiences of that trip, um, it bred a, a heart for missions into Evelyn. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was privileged enough to go on a missions trip through our church uh, to Thailand. And Evelyn was old enough at that time to know and understand the complexities and the ministry and the heart behind uh, something like a missions trip. And uh, from that time on, Evelyn often spoke of wanting to go on a trip. And as she heard of other kids in our church having the experiences to go, it was something that she often spoke and dream of. Um, our family and Evelyn believed deeply in community and in children's ministry and in ministry to youth and to families. And so when Debbie and Eric came to us and presented the opportunity to have a child development center built and uh, to be named after our sweet girl, um, we just felt like God had really guided this because it gives Evelyn a chance to be on a mission trip through spirit. Yeah, so um, we just feel honored and blessed that we get to be a part of this journey and that uh, Evelyn still gets to be a part of these experiences and to continue to see dreams of hers come true. So as a quick pressure for those of you that might need it, Joseph was one of the sons of Jacob, also known as Israel. And he had 12 brothers. And as the favored one, uh, favored by his father, uh, Jacob, he ended up being the source of much jealousy and envy to his brothers, and so his brothers ended up betraying him and selling him into slavery in Egypt. Obviously, that's a, a less than ideal situation, being sold into slavery. But, but in spite of that, he ended up uh, as being the second most powerful person in, in Egypt, right next to, uh, to Pharaoh. So in his position as uh, second of command to Pharaoh, Joseph was, oversaw uh, the Egyptian response to, to, to a famine that was ongoing in Egypt and the surrounding area. And because of that, his, his brothers who had sold him into slavery ended up coming to Egypt in order to, to get food because there was no other region in the area had food. And so everyone came to Egypt in order to get food. And in his position as second in command to Pharaoh, uh, Joseph encountered his brothers, the brothers, same brothers who he hadn't seen in, in years and years and years, the same brothers who thought that he was kind of assumed that he was either either dead or, or rotting away in, in, in jail somewhere. And this is where the this reading and the story picks up. This portion of the reading is from Genesis chapter 45, verses 3 to 8. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. They were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, 
but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house, a ruler over all the land of Egypt. In the chapters that follow, we see Joseph being reconciled to his brothers, being reconciled to his family, and he basically brings his entire extended family over to Egypt because that's where the food was and that's where he was. Um, over time, his father gets, gets old and, and dies, and naturally in that, when, when that happens, his brothers are, are fearful that uh, Joseph will now carry out some sort of retribution uh, because of what they had done to him in the past. And this is where the next reading picks up. This portion of the reading is from Genesis chapter 50, verse 1, and verses 15 to 21. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Moving on to verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. Now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear. Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Our time of congregational prayer today will consist of a combination of adaptations of historical prayers in the church, as well as portions of the Psalms. And they will be structured in a, in a more participatory manner. And so I encourage you all to, to follow along with the prayers on the screen and to also prayerfully respond by, by reading the, the portions that appear in bold font. Thank you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your infirmities. He redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with mercy and loving kindness. He satisfies you with good things and your youth is renewed like an eagle's. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all who are oppressed. He made his ways known to Moses and his works to the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. He will not always accuse us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so is his mercy great upon those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. As a father cares for his children, so does the Lord care for those who fear him. O oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully, Grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Remember, O Lord, this city wherein we dwell, and every other city and country and all the faithful who dwell in them. Remember, O Lord, all who travel by land, air, or water. All that labor under sickness or slavery, remember them for health and safety. Remember, O Lord, those in your holy church who bring forth good fruit, are rich in good works, and forget not the poor. Grant unto us all your mercy and loving kindness, and grant that we may, with one mouth and one heart, praise and glorify your great and glorious name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now 
and forever. Amen. God, in this um, unprecedented time that we live in, we, we pray for your, for your wisdom, your courage, and compassion. Give us eyes that are that are seeing the work that you that you could need to do around us. Give us hearts that are that are soft to the guidance of your spirit. And ears that are listening to your still small voice. And may this time of worship, may this time that we spend together, may be may be pleasing to you. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. If you're like me, you love food, and I especially love my wife's cooking. Uh, one of the, my favorite dishes that she prepares for me is called butter chicken, and uh, you'll see a little picture of what butter chicken looks like right here um, over my right shoulder. Um, but I, I thought about food and, and how we blend different ingredients together to make a sumptuous dish. And the, so I, I got the recipe, my wife's recipe for butter chicken, and it's right here in my hand. And, and, and here are some of the ingredients that go into butter chicken. Um, so you've got here salt and pepper. Uh, this is masala. I haven't tasted that by itself. But, uh, and then behind that is grapeseed oil. And then right here, uh, there's chili powder, um, butter, um, and then there's uh, some coriander, uh, seed, some curry. Um, there is here some ginger and, um, and then some onion and some garlic. Now, each of these ingredients by themselves doesn't taste good. They're, they're, they're kind of bitter. And, and I know what ginger tastes like. I tried this by mistake once uh, by itself. And uh, I don't recommend it. Not good. Um, I'm not going to try. I've got a little clove of garlic here, and I thought I might just take a bite of it uh, here to entertain you, but I think I'm, oh, that's terrible. Okay. Um, but it's interesting how life is like a recipe. Um, just as my wife's recipe for butter chicken, which is so tasty, um, has all these bitter ingredients in it, and, and things even like butter, butter, raw butter by itself is horrible. And so when you put all these together, you blend them, and then you cook them. You have to heat them up, uh, and you put in all the ingredients in the right proportions. Then it makes for a very savory meal, and life is like that. Earlier, Shamal Ranasinga, one of our board members, read the scripture to you and explained a little bit about it. It's, it's the story of Joseph, and uh, Joseph had a lot of bitter experiences in his life, and he had some sweet experiences in his life as well. Um, you know that his brothers had betrayed him um, and abandoned him, and then eventually he came to a place of power where he had the, the capacity to get even with them, to pay them back for what they, they did. And you know, I, I've never been betrayed the way uh, we read about in the story of Joseph, um, but I have been um, wrongly accused. Uh, I've been mistreated. Uh, I have felt like you have misunderstood sometimes. Um, I have had my motives impugned. Um, I've had uh, people verbally and emotionally uh, abuse me. And so I know a little bit about that sort of pain, the mistreatment of other people. Um, but the Lord has taught me through my Christian experience, to look at life through the lens of His sovereign grace. God is sovereign, which means that He is in control. And because of His grace, God can take all the bad in our lives and turn it into something good. So even in the worst moments of my life, I know that God was there. Even before I knew God, He was watching over me and bringing me to a place of faith in the Lord Jesus, and bringing me to the place where I am now where I can fulfill His purpose in my life. And so I can be at peace with 
everything in my past, the bitter experiences as well as the sweet experiences of my life. And I can be at peace with those who've hurt me or who have wounded me because I know that God was in control and watching over me the whole time to bring me to the place that I am now in my life. And so the Lord has taught me through that the grace of forgiveness. Um, God can take the worst uh, evils inflicted upon you and he can turn them into something good for you and for others. So how about you that are watching this today? Um, maybe you're uh, at a place in your life where you're filled with grievance. I, I, I know people like this. I've met people like this in my life. Their whole life uh, is about uh, deep-seated um, bitterness and resentment. Uh, they fantasize about uh, ways that they can get even with the people who have offended them or hurt them in some way. Um, and, you know, it's just not a good way to go through life. You know, these people, what they'll, I, I imagine that what they're doing is they're thinking um, mentally about how they will be able to uh, pay those people back and how good they're going to feel when they do get their revenge. Well, I got news for you. If you get your revenge and you do to people what they did to you, you're not going to feel good. You're going to feel worse. You know what feels good? Here's what feels good. It feels good to confess the things you've done wrong. If you've hurt other people, if you've wounded them, mistreated them, if you repent of that and you, and you tell them and make it right with them, that feels good. And the other thing that feels good is if somebody has mistreated you in some way is when you extend the hand of forgiveness and even go beyond that and also offer kindness to them. Wow, there is no feeling like that feeling. That is God's way. And so I want to encourage you uh, to do that and, and, and not to let the grievances or the injustices of the past keep you from doing the will of God in the present. And so back to the story of Joseph. Um, it, if you read Genesis uh, chapter uh, 37 to 50, the last several chapters of the book of Genesis, you'll find that Joseph was the youngest of 11 sons at that time, and he was the favored son of his father, Jacob. And it tells us that his brothers were jealous of him, and to make matters worse, um, he had these dreams that his brothers would one day bow down before him in servitude. That you know, He had this dream about these sheaves of wheat, and his brother's sheaves of wheat were bowing down to his sheave of wheat. And they thought, how arrogant is our baby brother? And so what they did eventually is they um, took him on a journey and they abandoned him. They threw him into a pit um, and they left him for some Midianite uh, slave traders. And he was brought to Egypt. Um, and his, the story there is he eventually uh, finds a place uh, in the house of Potiphar, uh, an, an Egyptian man, and he serves in his household, and things are pretty good until Potiphar's wife accuses him of rape, and then there's the downward spiral uh, where he eventually ends up in prison, which is really like a dark, dank dungeon, a horrible existence. And then because Joseph was able to interpret dreams. He interprets the dreams of two men that were in prison with him. And because of that, he eventually finds his way to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and interprets one of his dreams. And because of the interpretation and the wisdom that Pharaoh saw in Joseph, eventually Pharaoh says, I am going to make you second in power and authority only to me. And what happened was that the dream that Pharaoh had was that there would be seven years of prosperity in Egypt followed by seven years of famine. And when Joseph was able to interpret that to Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, I am going to put you in charge of all uh, the food in Egypt. And so when the seven years of famine come, you can be in charge of the distribution of that food for all who come seeking help. And so he becomes governor. And he's second in power to Pharaoh alone. And so basically Joseph goes um, from the pit where his brothers left him into prison 
uh, down, down, and then eventually is elevated to the palace. Um, and so we read in Genesis chapter 45, and Shramal read that to you earlier, that when Joseph's brothers eventually come before him, um, not knowing that their brother Joseph is this Egyptian lord, uh, they bow down before him. They prostrate themselves in servitude, asking for food and grain. And Joseph must have realized in that moment that that was the fulfillment of the sheaves of wheat that were bowing down before his sheaf of wheat. And then eventually, the, the, uh, the Bible tells us that Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers. And he said, hey, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you betrayed and left for dead. But don't worry, because God used this to bring about your salvation so I could take care of you and your family. Well, things were good for a while, but then Jacob, their father, dies. And now Joseph's brothers are worried that he's now going to pay them back for the wrongs that they did to him. And so they fabricate this story uh, saying, uh, Joseph, uh, our dad, before he died, uh, wants you to know that you shouldn't mistreat us, uh, that you need to be really good to us. And Joseph hears this, and he senses the fear in his brothers. And um, it tells us that he wept. Joseph uh, got emotional about that. And he had compassion for his brothers. Um, and Joseph is filled with mercy towards his brothers. And this is what Joseph says. And this is what I want us to focus on. In verses 19 and 20, Genesis chapter 50, Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Am I God to judge you? You intended to harm me, but God, there's those words, but God, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God had given Joseph deep insight into his ways. In retrospect, Joseph was able to see that everything that had happened to him, the pit, the prison, and eventually the palace, that that was all part of God's plan to bring him to this place where he was able to help his family. Uh, it didn't make sense at the time that Joseph was going through it. But Joseph now realized that God can take the worst evils of our lives and use them to bring about something good. And so Joseph shows mercy to his brothers. But he doesn't stop there. He takes the next step. And it tells us in verse 21 that Joseph then said, I will take care of all of you, my brothers and your families. And so I want to challenge you with this and ask you this question. Why do we need to hear this story about Joseph in the Old Testament? I mean, that happened thousands of of years ago. Why is this important for us today? Well, it's because of a verse in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 4. It says this, that these things were written, everything written in the Bible was written to teach us, to serve as an example for us. You know what? People in thousands of years, we have not changed really that much. And so I want to ask you, who are you in this story? Maybe you identify with Joseph's brothers. Maybe you're uh, a person who's um, inflicted pain upon somebody. Maybe you've mistreated somebody. Maybe you've bullied someone. Um, and if that's you, I want to encourage you, and I want to challenge you today to do what Joseph's brothers did. I want you to go to those people, if you can, or write them, and confess what you've done. Admit it. Acknowledge it. And say, you know what? Uh, you know, a, a few months ago, I, I said this, I did this, and I, I have to ask you to forgive me. And what I would challenge you to do if, if you're that person is why don't you take a piece of paper and write down the names 
of some of those people that you need to go to or organizations that you need to go to and make it right. Or maybe you identify with Joseph, the victim in this story. Um, so if you identify with Joseph and you're feeling victimized right now and aggrieved, here's what I'd like to ask you to do. I want you to first of all say, Lord, thank you for your sovereign grace. Thank you that in all those experiences, the bitter ones as well as the sweet ones, that you were with me, you were watching over me. And I thank you, Lord, that you have the power and the will to transform all the circumstances of my life and use them for good. Um, would you submit yourself to the will of God and just say, Lord, whatever comes my way and whatever has come my way, I'm okay with it. And then what I want you to do is I want you to take a piece of paper and I want to ask you to write down the names of all those people that you have held a grudge against or the people who have wounded you in some way. Write their names down and I, maybe stop and pray and ask the Lord to reveal anybody that you need to forgive. And then what I want you to do is I want you to take a match. I better be careful here. And I want you to take that paper and light it on fire and burn it. And don't blow it out like I did, but maybe throw it in a safe place until it is burned completely and there is no more record of wrongs. Isn't this what the Lord taught us through Jesus where it says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, God has reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. God did that for you, and he did that for me. And so we need to forgive just as the Lord himself forgave us. Would you do that? And then would you ask the Lord to show you how you can show kindness to these people as you have opportunity? See, it isn't enough to just do no harm and not seek revenge. But we must also overcome evil by doing good to those who have mistreated us in some way. And so I'm going to challenge you to do that and make that the application of this message. Do what Joseph did and not only show mercy, but also show grace and kindness. You know what mercy is? Mercy is the minimum of what we should do. Mercy is just where we withhold the bad things that people do deserve. But grace and kindness is where we give the things to people that they don't deserve. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to do that. I want you to think right now of what's the worst thing that you think anybody could do against you, to wound you, to hurt you. Um, can you imagine how God might take that and transform it into something good? Uh, imagine the difference that you could make in the world if you would give up the bitterness and the resentments of your life. Begin to look through the lenses of God and be able to see from his perspective that he can take the worst of evils inflicted upon you and turn them into something good and something for his glory. The prayer of serenity says, God, grant me the serenity, the peace, to accept the things I cannot change. That's the first part of that prayer. Can you do that? Just say, God, help me to accept the past, all the bitter experiences of my life. And then, Lord, would you show me how I can use that to accomplish your purposes today? With all the injustices that occurred in Joseph's life, 
God was busy preparing him for what was to come. Joseph probably did not know what God's game plan was. He didn't see the long road. God always sees the long road. But Joseph did have faith in God. He didn't have all the insight that he needed at the time. But later on, in retrospect, he could see what God was up to. That's why he was able to say, what you intended for good, God, or what you intended for harm, God meant for good. And so we see God's sovereignty uh, most clearly through the cross of Jesus Christ himself. Um, you know, when I read the story of Joseph, I can't help but think of Jesus because he was betrayed by Judas, one of his closest followers. And then he was denied by his closest disciple, Peter, and deserted by all the rest. He was abandoned and forsaken by those who were closest to him. And yet God used all of that to bring redemption to the world. God used the cross where Jesus died to bring about our forgiveness and our salvation. They intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. So would you accept God's recipe for your life? All these bitter ingredients that go into butter chicken, think about the bitter experiences of your life and say, God, that's all part of your recipe. And all of these ingredients that you pour into my life, that you allow me to experience, you just have a beautiful way of mixing all that together and making something beautiful out of it. Would you accept that? You don't have to let the grievances of the past stop you from doing the will of God in the present. Would you be like Joseph? And would you be like Jesus? And would you say to those who've hurt you, wounded you, mistreated you, would you say, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. And I hold no grudges. Would you pray with me? In prayer, I'm going to ask you, would you be willing to come before God and ask the Holy Spirit for the grace to see all the wrongs ever done against you as something that he can use to bring about a greater good. You need spiritual insight for that. Say, Holy Spirit, I want to see my life the way you see it. I want to see the long road. I want to understand my life the way you understand it. Would you be willing to trust God in the dark? When nothing in your life seems to make sense. When you seem to be on a downward spiral and you feel that you've been forsaken. Trust him. Would you say to God, Lord, my life is not my own. It belongs to you. So if the things, Lord, that have happened in my life up until now are a part of your plan and purpose, then I submit myself right now to your will. Because of your great love and compassion, nothing that anyone has ever done to harm me can thwart your purposes for my life. Thank you, Lord, that you're able to take all of the ingredients of my life, the bitter ones and the sweet ones, the bad and the good, and use them to accomplish your purposes. And as we continue in prayer, would you now be willing to show kindness to those who've mistreated you, who persecuted you and caused you harm? Would you be willing to surrender your right to get even? Because this is what the Bible teaches us. So to show mercy, but not just to stop at mercy, to also go the next mile, and that is to show kindness to those 
who've been cruel to you. And pray this with me, please. Lord, because you've shown kindness to me and you have forgiven me my transgressions, my sins, I now commit myself to show kindness to those who've mistreated me. I surrender my right to get even or to return evil for evil. By your grace, I choose to return wrath with kindness. Remember that no matter how much evil has been inflicted upon you, God can use it to bring about something good. You can always choose the way of mercy and grace and kindness. That is the way that Jesus taught us. Would you ask God now for insight? Ask Him to reveal how He wants to use you in the present and in the future. And would you say, Lord, please show me what your plan is now. Show me what part you want me to play in accomplishing your grand purpose. I want to do your will and not my own. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey, everybody, thank you for joining us today for our service of worship and celebration. Uh, I just want to say, if you said that prayer at the end and you want to talk to me about it, uh, my contact information is on the screen. I'd love to hear from you, uh, so please do that. Also, if you're watching this and you don't have a church uh, that you're a part of, if you don't have a Christian fellowship that you're, that you're a part of, it's really important for your own spiritual growth um, and development that you find a church or uh, some kind of a house group, um, a group of Christian friends that you can gather with who can help you uh, grow spiritually. Uh, last week I had mentioned our children's ministry. Specifically, I mentioned our, our AWANA program, A-W-A-N-A, -A, and that's a midweek uh, program on Wednesday nights uh, where we have lots of kids that fill up our church building typically, um, and it's all about discipleship. It's all about memorizing Scripture and learning how to apply God's Word to their lives. And it's from uh, kids ages 3 uh, through grade 6. Uh, we need volunteers for this ministry. So right now we're doing it online, but we're hoping to open up uh, as well on site soon. Uh, the date so far uh, for starting Awana is September the 23rd. So we need volunteers who can um, help with the Awana ministry, uh, teach these kids, uh, work with them on their crafts, and so on, and their scripture memory. Uh, to do this online, if you don't feel safe doing it on site, but we still need people uh, who can join us online. But if you can also um, uh, be here when we do open it up on site, to do it here in person, uh, that would be appreciated as well. And then, um, if you can help at all with Awana, uh, what a blessing it is to pour your life into the lives of the next generation. I'm serious. It is really a privilege. And so, we're lacking volunteers right now. We need a lot more for the number of kids we're expecting. Uh, the other thing is, um, some of the families that are signing up for Awana uh, are uh, feeling some financial hardship. And so we have had a program in years past called Every Kid to Camp, and we would sponsor people. Various people would sponsor kids to go to camp. We want to ask if you'd sponsor kids to go to Awana. And so there's information on the screen um, on how you can contact um, Laurel or Megan if you want to volunteer, but also there's a, um, a way that you can give online if you want to uh, support a child or a family so their kids don't have to miss out on Awana. You could also just talk to Laurel or Megan themselves about that. Um, so we got some big news that we're going to share with you next Sunday uh, at our Church at Home service. That's September the 20th about reopening, so stay tuned for that. Our prayer summit is September the 19th, next Saturday night, beginning at 6.30. This is an earlier time than we've had in the past, so I just want to alert you to that. So thanks again for joining us, and God bless you all. Please stay safe and healthy. See you soon.